Guess what? We're starting a new weekly class called A Yoga of Business. And this is for all of you who have sent me emails in the past and of late, asking questions and seeking some advice on the business and production side of things. I've been getting an increased number of those inquiries since the pandemic hit, as a lot of people are scrambling a little bit to figure out how to navigate this new landscape. And, you know, I always try to give some advice in those emails, but whatever advice I'm giving is secondhand because it's my producer, Josh Citron, who's the person that really did all of this for me. He's the one who helped me develop this platform that I have. And he did that based on his own experience of doing independent music and video production. And so he has agreed to do this weekly class with us where we're going to completely open it up and be entirely transparent about everything that we're doing. We're going to make it completely open source so that you can see for yourself and figure out how you can make some of the things that we're doing work for you. We are going to talk about succeeding without social media. We're going to talk about creating your art and letting that bring people to you rather than trying to sell people on things. We're going to talk about what it means to own the digital land on which you sit. We're going to talk about sustainability over growth and digital tools and audio video production and best practices there. Most importantly, we're going to talk about a new bliss money balance. That's right, bliss money balance. Because ultimately, it amounts to a radical new way of thinking about what we're doing and how we conduct the business aspect. It's a live weekly class. If you can't make it live, then you can send in questions and watch it on the replay. There's limited space. We're never going to have more than 20 people in there at any one time. So you might want to get in on it early. It's called A Yoga for Business. Go check it out. You can learn more and register at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. What's good, y'all? How's everybody doing? I don't know how it is where you are, but where I am, things don't feel quite as apocalyptic as they did last week. Here in America, it seems like the institutions might hold just enough to avoid our worst fears. But that's not to say we're doing great. I mean, everything with the pandemic starting to feel again, oh, stressful. But I don't really want to talk about that today. Is that okay? I don't want to talk about the pandemic. I don't want to talk about that right now. Actually, what I want to do today is get back to something that I used to do in the old days of this show. And I got to thank Cecile in Italy because Cecile wrote me this week and she said that she's a long time listener and she asked if maybe I could spend a few minutes reading some of our fellow listeners' comments. Because if you've been around for long enough, you'll remember I used to do that all the time. I used to read the emails that I get from people. And Cecile asked me if I would do that because she said to get a better sense of community. And that is very much what today's episode with Chris Priest is about. And just to say to Cecile, the reason why I stopped reading the emails, honestly, is that generally most of them are like complimentary. They're people writing me because they've gotten from the show and they want to share that with me and they're saying nice things to me. And I love them. I love the emails. I read them all. I email back to most of them when I can. But at some point I started to feel like reading the emails of people just telling me how much they think I'm good or they like the show, it started to feel like braggadocia. Started to feel like me 
tooting my own horn, and so I sort of stopped doing it. But when I read your email about a sense of community, and when you listen to today's episode with Chris Priest, he, he quotes Desika Char quoting Thich Nhat Hanh to say that the future Buddha is the Sangha. And it made me feel like, all right, I should. I should read some of these emails because I get wonderful emails from you, the listeners. So I'm going to do it. And if you're new to the show and you're like, what's this? I wanted to listen to Chris Priest. I totally get it. I'm probably going to do this for, I don't know, maybe about 10 minutes before we get to the talk. So you can totally skip ahead. I will not be offended. But for those of you who want to stick around, it might be fun for you to hear what some of your fellow listeners write me after they listen to the show. First, I'm going to read some from real recent, like in the last week or two. This one says, Hi, Jay. Just listen to your episode on holding space. I want to say that your show really matters to me, and thank you for holding space for me. The thing you do has created space for me to explore nuance around important issues, including the role of gurus, and I'm extremely grateful. I'm a social worker in Ottawa, Canada, and without a doubt you have contributed to my well-being, which I am in turn able to offer to others. Keep up the good work as long as it continues to serve you. Pat. Thank you, Pat, especially for that last note of as long as it continues to serve you. To me, that shows that you actually really do care about me, and I I so appreciate that. Thank you so much. And today's episode goes right to this question of the role of gurus and traditions, so I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks for sending me the note, Pat. Now, this one is also just from recent. (laughs) It says, Nobody told me there would be days like these. Hi, Jay. Just reaching out. I was listening to the pod last night, and your run of bad luck resonated with me. I've had what seems like more than my fair share of those shitty chains of events over the years. Or at least it always feels like that at the time. What? Me again? Come on! You did well. It's hard to get your head above the clouds some days. And that's just the human condition even if you got yoga on your side. Chin up, my friend. Best of the best, always. James. Thank you, James. And you know what's really funny about that, James? When I smashed my car last week, (laughs) I actually did say that exact thing. I I said, come on, you got to be kidding me. I actually yelled that out loud. So (laughs) thanks for uh, your note and uh, making me feel like I'm not alone in it. All right, so let me see. There are a couple others here. This one's from a little bit longer back, a few months ago, I think. It says, loved your reflection after T.S. Little chat. Dear Jay, I haven't laughed so much in months. You lifted my day. Thank you. Listening to your reflection about your Zoom class being cut off due to your daughter logging in at home, especially when you lost it and someone said, Jay, we're still here. (laughs) I had a similar experience during lockdown, so I can empathize and found it hilarious. You keep it real, Jay. Thank you for your tireless efforts. I love your podcast. Love, Mina. Well, love back, Mina. Thank you. That was hilarious. (laughs) If you don't know what Mina's referring to, you can go back and listen to that T.S. Little Chat outro where I talked about Uh, kind of losing my shit in front of everybody and then (laughs) realizing that they were all watching me. Funny. Thank you, Mina. Appreciate knowing that you're out there. Thanks for taking that time. Now, I've got two more here. This one says, Dear Jay, for many years now, I am grateful for your podcast and I love all about it. I started listening from the very beginning and can't wait for the next one to get released. I appreciate the in-depth conversations you're having with others, your honesty, the questioning and digging, and that I am able to take in such great content for free. I'm living quite away from an accessible yoga world. My home is a small beach community in Nicaragua, and sometimes I would not know what to do if not for people like you 
making it easier for people like me to have access to such great material. For me, living so far away, yoga teacher gems like yours are vital. It's so helpful that there's a chance for me to keep learning and growing. Thank you again, and I wish you all the best for your family and for yourself. Keep it up. Some folks out there really appreciate your work. Kind regards, Aurelia. Oh, Aurelia, thank you. I hope you're still listening out there in Nicaragua. <laughs> thank you. It, it means a lot to me that um, you're connecting to the show and that you sent me that note. All right, I've got one more here. And this one is from very beginning of the year. And if you were listening back then, you know, shit got hectic. And that was before the pandemic hit. But there was a lot of uh, really important emails for me at that time. And when I was looking back through the folder of some of those getting ready to talk to you today, I found this one. It says, hi, Jay, I've been listening to your podcast for a couple years now. I owned a yoga studio for 19 years. I sold it in September of 2017, same month as you. I discovered your show shortly after I sold the studio when I actually had free time for the first time in two decades. Ha! Anyway, my point here is that I've loved your show and it has been so therapeutic to me on so many levels. So many things you talk about with your guests resonate with me. From the 90s yoga scene to the boom and to all the changes that happened in between and after. There's so much there and you've been able to help me unpack buzzword of the year things and process them. Without your podcast, I'm not sure that I could still even like yoga. I have so much more to say on that, but that's not my reason for writing today. I think you are brave and honest. I cried with you this morning. What is that Oprah and Maya Angelou said? When we know better, we do better. Something like that. And sorry to be cheesy with the quote. None of us knew better a decade ago, or maybe we did, but we saw it through a different lens. I'm writing this on the fly in my car right after listening this morning. I have an appointment in a couple of minutes, and I know this might sound rushed and convoluted. But just to say, keep up the great work of always doing the right thing and owning things where you can. I'm counting on you to be one of the teachers to show us how to do and be yoga in this day and age. I will be a listener for as long as you're putting content out. I'm thinking of you today and feeling your heaviness with you. Using your words, be kind to yourself. That's from Sarah. Sarah, I, I don't know if I actually wrote you back when you wrote this to me at the beginning of the year. Frankly, I, I got very overwhelmed and I, I, didn't, I didn't answer a lot of the emails that I received at that time. There was a period there. So I don't know if I ever wrote you a note, but if you're listening right now, I can't tell you how much this note from you meant to me. And just everybody who listens on a regular, I used to talk about this more in the past, but this show is like keeping me sane more than anything. I mean, yes, my daily yoga practice and the classes that I teach, but this particular medium of me just like talking in this free form way and connecting to people who are coming on the show and then connecting through these emails that you're sending me. It really is the sangha of, of sorts for me. It is, it is where I am continuing to learn and grow in ways that I would not if I didn't have this show or listeners like you who are engaging it. So just big thanks to, <laughs> to all of you who send me emails and those who don't, who just listen. It, it's really very, very meaningful, and I am profoundly grateful. And, you know, it is, as I was saying earlier, very much in the spirit of today's talk with Chris Priest. The reason these emails jumped out at me when I was getting ready to talk to you today is because... There's themes running through them in terms of reconciling gurus and traditions and in terms of accurate history and figuring out like how we're going to do the right thing. And, and what Sarah just said to me about 
you know, how to do and be yoga in this day and age. And I really appreciated Sarah kind of saying that she's counting on me. You know, on one hand, that feels like a little bit of pressure. But on the other hand, it feels like a friend who's urging me along. And I need that. And I'm trying to be that for you. Like, let's be friends helping each other get through the stuff, you know? So big, big love to all y'all out there. Now, as I mentioned, I got Chris Priest here today. And Chris, he's a TKV Desikachar guy. I mean, he didn't study directly. You'll hear he studied with Paul Harvey. I had um, Ranju and Dave on recently, if you remember. He knows them. You'll hear we go through a little bit of his connections with some other guests on the show. But I really enjoyed this conversation. Chris really he said a few things that I've been thinking about since. So I'm super excited that you're going to get to hear them today. Real quick before we do, let me mention that this episode is brought to you in support by podcast premium subscribers like Ava Reina and Islian Kinghorn. Thank you to Ava and Islian and all of our podcast premium subscribers. Really, it's the best way to help support this show. And you also get full access to the archives. If you're not familiar with our podcast premium subscription, it is a choose your rate. And if you are someone who was really hoping to get into some of those old episodes and you're really in a bad financial situation, you can always just email us and we will totally give you a free account. But if you can't afford it and you listen to the show on a regular, it makes such a difference for us. So again, thank you for everybody who's doing that. If you want to find out more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber, along with all of my other stuff, whether it's my live stream classes or the teacher's call or my on-demand video stuff, everything, including a way to email me. If you want to send me emails, all my stuff can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, I think that's it. I am going to touch base with you on the other side for just a moment or two, as I like to do, to send you on your way. But for now, let's go ahead and get to this. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Chris Priest. Hello? Hello. Hi, Chris. Hello, Jay. Good to speak with you. Good to speak with you, sir. I've been looking forward to it. Thank you for your time today. That's all right. You're welcome. And um, remind me, you are in the UK, is that right? That's right. I'm in Bristol, Bristol. which is the southwest of of, uh, Britain. I see. And how was your day? Pretty good so far. I've... uh, did a bit of Zen. Uh, today is, uh, cause I don't work today. I mean, as in, I don't do my other job, my professor job. Uh, today I, um, so I did a bit of Zen and then my yoga sutra group, uh, chanting group met. And then I went for a walk into town, uh, to collect some wine. Wow. That really does sound like a good day to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it is in a pretty sharp contrast to me because I'm in Pennsylvania. And I don't know if you know anything about the elections happening here in the United well, States. Well, yeah, too, right. I'm constantly uh, updating 538. <laughs> I don't have a vote. My wife is American, actually, or rather I should say both her parents are American. She was born in the UK, so she has American citizenship. She's completely obsessed. So it rubs on, off on me as well. Well, I moved to Pennsylvania three years ago, or almost, well, me almost four years ago, three and a half years ago, and mm. I knew it was, you know, like a swing state or whatnot, but this particular election, Pennsylvania is like this huge hot zone, so the president literally had a rally from where I am right now, like 10 miles from here, like oh, right. earlier this week, and um, so it's a it's pretty crazy, but... <laughs> In any case, I'm glad to have some time to just talk with you. And I love what you said. You said you did a little Zen. There seems to be a paradox in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to, You can't not do. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know. I just like the way you said that. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, I'm glad to speak with you. I know we had some email exchanges and... Mm. You know, I always enjoy talking to people who have some direct study with 
either TKV Deskachar or his direct students. Yes. Mm. You know, there was that celebration for him a couple years ago, and I mm. had like a string of talks with people who had studied with him. And that's because even though I never really got to meet him so much and only learned through his students, TKV Deskachar certainly has been, I'd say, I don't know, the biggest um, influence for me as a practitioner and a teacher. Mm. And the thing that I've always found so interesting in talking to the people who have, you know, direct interaction with men, even recently I had Amy Wheeler on and yeah. she described his teaching and it seems like it was so, as they say, individualized people mm. got teaching for them. Mm. And so I've also recently had, um, Dave on and Ranju on, and I know you know them. Too right, I do. <laughs> so, yeah. and Paul Harvey, who I still can't get on the show, but I know you know all those folks. So in yeah. any case, it just, it always feels um, like a pleasure for me to get a chance to speak with someone like you who's got some of that direct experience because I know at least on some level we're on the same wavelength. Mm, mm. Although I would also say that Zen is something I don't know as much about, but does seem to have some differences. Maybe, maybe we could get into that. I don't know. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess just to clue other people in who might be listening to this, how do you tie into all those people? Like maybe you can um, say something about your connection to TKV Desika Chart. Certainly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I started practicing yoga as soon as I left university is when I first started. And I, um, at that time, I went just to the nearest local class, which was in a school hall and practiced and got something out of it. And I would say that I actually was drawn to yoga. What happened was that when I left university, I'd split up, my relationship had kind of split up. I was in a new tech, new city, uh, had kind of lost my way a bit and felt instinctively that I needed to uh, not look outside myself for meaning, but find something within myself. And for some reason, in my mind, yoga was the thing to do. I can't really explain why, but yoga was the thing to do. And so I went to a, a, a class, just the nearest class nearby, and started practicing there and appreciated it. And then that class closed, closed down. The woman, uh, I can't remember why, maybe she was going to have a child, I can't remember, but she stopped teaching. And she sent us to someone else. And the person that she sent me to, um, the person she recommended was a woman called Chris Fielder. And so then I went along to Chris Fielder's yoga class together with my two flatmates, both men. Uh, the three of us went along and there was a group of about 25 and we were the only men there. All the, other, it, all the rest of the people were women. And Chris actually came up to us afterwards and it turns out that Chris specialised and probably still does specialise in antenatal and postnatal yoga. And so most of these women were postnatal women who'd come uh, but nonetheless, we stuck at it. At least I did. I think my two friends sort of fell away by the side, but I stuck at it. And in fact, I was so taken with it that I decided that I wanted to go into India to study further. And so I said to Chris, I said this to Chris, Chris Fielder, and she said, well, in that case, you need to study with my teacher, Paul Harvey. Mm -hmm. And she sent me to Paul, who was teaching not that far away, still within walking distance of my home. Uh, and so I started practicing with Paul. And fairly quickly, because he knew that I wanted to go to India, he started giving me one-to-one -one lessons, which, as you will have heard, is the main way that uh, teaching is done uh, in the tradition of Desi Kishar. Mm -hmm. And so I started regular one-to-one -one with lessons with Paul to get me kind of up to speed with the yoga. And as a result of that, I was doing my daily practice, which is, again, an important part of Desi Kishar's teaching, is the value of an individual personalised daily practice. And so I was doing that and time got closer for me to go to India, which was about a year from when I started with Paul, if I remember rightly. It was, uh, it was basically December 1989 was when, I, was when I went to India. And Paul said, I can find you a flat. And he found me a really nice flat on the beach in Besan Nagar, which is within cycling distance of the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandaram. And he said, you'll share it with someone else and I think you'll get on with him. And 
I went out there not having met this person I was going to share with. And the person who I shared with was with Dave Charlton. So we spent, uh, I think about maybe six to eight weeks uh, together sharing a flat uh, and got on very well. Mm. And we would do our yoga together uh, in the early morning hours of the morning, looking out across the beach and seeing all the Indian men doing their press ups and their jogging and pushing weights and things or doing the, all the kind of Western aerobics. Mm. Uh, and then we would <laughs> cycle yeah, that's, into that's the That's ironic, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then we would cycle into the Mandaram for our lessons. Uh, and one of the things, one of the lessons that we did quite a lot of was chanting. Dave and I would chant together with uh, Sujaya. And we also studied the Yoga Sutras. And we studied the Yoga Rahasya. And we studied Yoga Therapy, th- therapy all at the Yoga Mandaram with various different teachers under the guidance of Dizika Shah. Mm. It would not be true to say that we were students of Dizika Shah. And I think uh, Dizika Shah had very few students and he was very clear about boundaries. And when we arrived, he knew we were students of Paul Harvey. And there is no way that he would have uh, interfered with that teacher-student relationship. But rather, his, he saw his role as uh, encouraging us through Paul and building a connection with us through Paul. Of course, some of that was directly. Uh, we, uh, David and I would go around to Dizika Shah's house for questions. Mm. And then when I returned to the UK, I'd already kind of signed up with Paul to do a course and I was studying. And then I did the teacher training course and I started the teacher training course. Dave was a senior at that time. The teacher training course was four years long and there was an overlap between the seniors and the juniors. And in the summer schools, the seniors would teach the juniors. So that meant in the summer schools in the third and the fourth year, I would be taught by Dave and his peers. Uh, so they would get there and Paul would observe and see what was going on. And along the course with me was Ranju. Uh, and so and Ranju and I became very close friends. We still are deeply close friends. I'm still a friend with Dave, but I don't see him as much. I'm lucky that Ranju lives quite close to my parents. And so when I visit my parents, I always call in on him. And I would say he's probably one of my closest friends. And that's something that's emerged out of yoga. Uh, And he's also, we are peers and we uh, interact with each other as peers in the yoga world to help uh, stimulate each other's thinking and guide each other. So that's kind of how I got to know them. The other thing I'd like to say is about in terms of the relationship with Paul and Desi Kashar, is that Desi Kashar, through the 90s, really supported his closest students. And one of the ways he supported his closest students was by teaching their senior students regularly, uh, but with 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 his student presence. So we would go to the Mandaram for two weeks, spend two weeks in a small group class discussing philosophy with Dizka Shah, the Yoga Sutras, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, though, of course, it was always more than that. Paul would be there and Dizka Shah would be teaching us. But again, he wasn't interfering in our relationship with Paul. He was trying to uh, strengthen it and build effectively by meeting with him. We would be, he would be working with his relationship with us, his relationship with Paul, Uh, Paul's relationship with us and our relationship with each other so it was very much kind of a systemic you could almost say um, uh, I wouldn't call it group therapy but uh, a a kind of working on the group dynamics to help us learn from each other and also when I say learn I don't mean just information I mean if you like getting to how our egos worked and the games our egos played that's very interesting you say that because that's kind of what Amy was saying too about his teaching that it had a lot to do with that last thing you just said. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but it also seems to me from what I know of you and Ranju and Dave and pretty much anybody who studied with Paul, like Paul was kind of serious business. He didn't play around and he really uh, seemed to attract serious minded practitioners and people who were really committed. And I think that kind of commitment it pays off in those kinds of friendships, right? Absolutely. And, and those kinds of patterns that service to this day, like you just told us, you had a chant, you had, did your Zen practice, mm-hmm. you know, those kinds of things. I don't know. I found those are the, the things that um, have really helped me more than anything. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Paul, what I learned from Paul, and again, learn is too weak a word, but 
the value of disciplined practice, uh, but that discipline needs to be gentle. If you see what I mean, so self discipline. Yeah, 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 that's an important, important yeah. uh, caveat or, or whatever. Addendum, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there was a metaphor. I think it was. I think. I think this came from Paul. It, it's. It is a traditional metaphor, and I think I, the first time I heard this was from Paul. Was about how when you have a musical instrument, you have the uh, a stringed instrument like a guitar. But um, the the original metaphor is with the Indian uh, musical instruments. You have the string, and if it's too loose, it wobbles too much, and if it's too tight, it snaps. So you need to get exactly the right amount of tension. It's the same with discipline in practice. You need, you need discipline. And this is why you have to, in the end, do Zen. You need enough discipline to get you on the mat. You can't just sort of float around feeling Zen. You've got to do it. But in the end, you need to go beyond that discipline, let go of that discipline, and make sure that discipline isn't so tight as to uh, snap you. That's right. I always make the distinction for myself as I do practices, you know, I mm. do the practice, but the yoga, it just is, or, you know, yeah. <laughs> you can't really do it, but no. you do things that help you have like a little more direct awareness or experience or something. Of it, yeah. Right? Yeah. I've got a quote from a, a Zen teacher. I think it's an American teacher. I'm not sure who, and that is, uh, enlightenment is an accident, but practice makes you more accident prone. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I've also just always liked that metaphor of like gardening, you know, that if you, if you tend to the garden, even like some years the weather might be bad and you don't get good tomatoes, you know, but if, if you do tend to the garden, you will inevitably get more tomatoes than if you didn't tend to the garden. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very true. (laughs) The other thing that I, I really appreciate that you just said is this idea that it needs to be gentle and you use the word gentle because that's a word I took on uh, some while back, but at the time when I took it on, it wasn't very popular because it was like mm. a power yoga craze kind of time. Mm. But it does seem to me, at least for my own practice, which is the only one I could speak to, the 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 need for the actual practice and discipline to have this quality of being gentle was imperative. And it's interesting to hear you say that. Was that always a component? So I think maybe I need to be clear about what I mean by gentle. Yes, uh, maybe. <laughs> so um, gentle with one's own ego. I think maybe that's the best way of saying it. We So um, if we are overly fierce with our discipline, our self-discipline, then that becomes an ego trip in its our own, own in its own right. If you see what I mean, we can mm. our ego can manifest in different ways. One way is just letting us do whatever we want, and the other way is being. Uh, overly controlling and finding that balance between the two steer asuka to use the yoga sutra term Mm -hmm. finding that balance between the two um uh, is really important so being gentle with one's own practice does not mean one doesn't do strong asana necessarily Mm -hmm. you can Mm -hmm. still have a gentle spirit of practice but do quite intense asana um of course Desika Shah quite rightly and paul quite rightly pointed out that different asana are appropriate at different times in life uh, depending mm. on our personal situation, etc. And so as we get older, naturally, uh, more gentle asana will become more appropriate uh, from a physical point of view. See, that's a good point. The idea of appropriateness, because that is really what it comes down to, because there was certainly a time in my life where doing that stuff was fun and served me in certain ways. Yeah. And mm. doesn't, doesn't do the same thing for me now, though. So mm. <laughs> it's a, mm. the idea of it being appropriate and being able to gauge what is appropriate, I guess, becomes more of the art. Yes, yes. I think one thing is about what will hold the mind. So in the end, it's about, yoga is about the mind. It's not about the body. Uh, well, that's not entirely true. It's, uh, it's about all, every, all of them, but yeah. primarily about the mind and how the body is related to the mind would be a better way of putting it. Uh, mm. And so what we need to do is find asana, which allow us to engage with the mind effectively and that means they shouldn't be too strong but on the other hand they shouldn't be too lax Mm. um, in some sense physically or in terms of the breath there needs to be something to use Dave Shelton's term he likes to talk about a practice must have bite there must be some bite there but if it's so strong that uh, you're in agony then your ego escapes in different ways Got you, got you. It does keep coming back to ego in what you're saying. I guess well, I, yes, have a, <laughs> I have a curiosity about um, the actual practice that you learned and specifically like the role of ujjayi pranayama 
Yeah. I'm curious about how, how much emphasis is Ujjayi placed on like your, sp- when you do asana or like simple vinyasas, is there always Ujjayi there or is it, could be there sometimes and not there other times? Uh, so for my practice, which I learned from Paul, so I know that Peter Hersnack, who taught Ranju and Dave uh, in, in, the, in the 2000s, um, had a different view. But from my practice, which I learned from Paul, one would always use Ujjayi. Yeah. But the key thing to be aware about with regard to Ujjayi is that Ujjayi must be subtle. Mm-hmm. And Paul had a guideline, which I thought was a really good line, uh, guideline, is that you should be able to hear it, but if the person on the next mat can hear it, it's not subtle. So uh, gotcha. if a teacher can hear you doing Ujjayi, uh, it's not subtle Ujjayi, it's gross Ujjayi. Uh, right. Well, and I, so I, I'll, I'll uh, just say, that, sorry to interrupt you, but I would just yeah. say, like, I, I've sometimes tried to make a case that um, letting someone do it louder, at least at the beginning to learn it, um, is sometimes helpful, but I agree it, it, it wants to be like that subtle and not not so much constriction. Yes, oh, that's I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. So to begin with, having having more sound there to allow them to become aware of their breath would be an appropriate teaching technique. But mm-hmm. as they become as that awareness grows, then that awareness can become more subtle. Again, I'd like to quote Paul. He uh, he likes to talk about how um, if we think about uh, focusing the mind on these things, we can apply our awareness. We can have a uh, a subtle awareness of the gross was an expression he used, or a gross awareness of the subtle. And a subtle awareness of the gross is if you get into real details of the body, exactly where something is moving, etc. Whereas a gross awareness of the subtle will be okay. Let's start getting into the breath using ujjayi, and then you can move from that to a subtle awareness of the subtle by reducing the amount of sound in there, etc. And that's one of his teachings that's always stuck with me, is how we need to move our awareness to more and more subtle levels through practice. But again, appropriate teaching is necessary, appropriate practices are necessary, because they help us move from the gross to the subtle in a way that works for us. Wow, I appreciate that. That, what you described is definitely like making Ujjayi Pranayama central is, mm. was like a key technical thing for me. I did study other approaches prior to that and even did Ujjayi. Like when I practiced Ashtanga Vinyasa, we always did Ujjayi, but we never, it was like secondary. Mm. And it was like overly forced because we were doing mm. these really aerobic things with our body and then trying to do Ujjayi on top of it. Mm. It was kind of like always a battle. Mm. So getting acquainted with Desikachar teachings and learning Ujjayi first and everything going to that was like this huge shift for me. Um, I do think over time though, I have like, I, it's still there in my practice and in my classes, but I have eased off on it some, you know, I, and letting people, inviting people into it a little bit more than like insisting upon it as I used to, <laughs> Right, mm. if that makes sense. But um, I do still think to me that, that Ujjayi at the center of asana makes the most sense. Yes, yes. Mm. Very interesting. All right, well, I guess the other thing that you were mentioning about Desika Chai that I'm curious about, it's sort of where you started and it's what Amy said. You talked about how what it seemed to you that his teachings were often about was like making you aware of your own ego stuff. Yes, yes. So well, how, did think- that, how did that play out for you? Like Amy told the story of him asking her to come up and like speak about something that she wasn't really qualified to speak about. And she did it anyways. And she said some things wrong and nobody told her, you know, until yeah. later she found, mm. and like he, so how did it happen for you? Like, Actually, what was Cause the, I, I listened to that story, but uh, I, I listened to the podcast that you did with Amy and I thought about that. Yeah. And what I would say about that, cause I think one thing about that, and I would say also when, when I think about the kind of things that Desi Kashar did with us, mm. it's not only about the individual. So when Desi Kashar was doing that, it wasn't only about Amy. She spoke about it from her personal point of view, but it was about the dynamics of the group as a whole. And I don't think he necessarily had a particular expectation of what was right or wrong in anyone's performance. You know, if he, if Amy had said, Oh, I really can't do this. Um, I don't think he was looking for any particular thing. I think what he was interested to do, he would throw a pebble skillfully into the pond and see what would happen. And he was ready to respond to what emerged from that. 
Hmm. Yeah, I think that was rather so you, than... So you think he was that playful? Like, let me see if oh, I definitely. just ask her to do this, what happens? Exactly. Playful is completely the right word. I can remember his mischievous fa- face. You know, there really were... You could. Uh, there was a certain face. He would almost... Uh, it still stays with me really vividly. He had this kind of big smile, but also it's like, like a cheeky schoolboy. Cause as you, as you know, he, he wasn't a, a tall person and he would mm. kind of crouch down, make himself even smaller. And if he was sitting in the chair, he would swing his legs back and forth like, a, like a child. Uh, mm. and he would have just tossed something playfully into the, into the group to see what would happen. Uh, and then he would be quite happy to play with whatever emerged. I don't think it was like he was, had a particular expectation. Um, so that's what I would say about, about, uh, his playfulness. Um, it, for me personally, the thing that he picked me up on, and it's interesting because my Zen teacher at that time was also picking me up on was youthful. So this phrase, I'm going to use my Zen teacher's phrase, youthful spiritual ambition, the desire to get the spiritual goodies quickly, uh, learn more chants, learn more asana, et cetera, et cetera, rather than going deeply into less stuff. And that was something that he picked me up on. I can't remember exactly, but he would, he would just, he actually in public. So this was in public, you know, there was some talk or something. It was, I think it was his, his yoga sutra class that I went along to um, the public class. And he made some comment at me um, about, he was teaching about some aspects of the sutra. And then he kind of used me as an example of, of being too enthusiastic to uh, going too fast. He made some comment about, you know, Chris, he, he's, he's uh, taking things a bit too fast. Mm. And, uh, and so that was, that was something that just kind of noticing the games that my ego were, was playing and then just gently tossing something in my direction was, was what I observed from him. Well, it's very interesting that you, you um, point to that moment for you. Mm. Did you feel like, shame was that like a public shaming uh no i didn't no i didn't feel shamed i think that's one of the things about so i have seen situations where i think people have felt shamed yeah so you know when if you are skillful if you are playful and a bit um i think you know kind of tricksterish Mm -hmm. again i would say that my zen teacher was a bit like this one of my first zen teachers then sometimes it goes wrong if you see what I mean. And yeah, you've got I guess, to be, no I'm, matter how wise you are, if you see what I mean, no matter how wise you are, sometimes it will go wrong. And so I have seen moments when uh, people have felt a bit um, kind of uh, shamed, maybe. Yeah, it's just interesting because I think I think I sometimes romanticize Jessica Char, you know, or even not Jessica Char. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.